Okay, uh, first of all, let me, let me thank Mike Lamone, um, uh, and he knows what for. Uh, this was, I thought this was going to be a poster, this contributed talk, but I'm delighted it's wrong. And, and Mike did give more talks than me. Okay, okay thank you. Let me off the hook. And, and, yeah, yes, okay, let me off the hook on that. Okay, uh, so we're, we're going to go back, we're going to go from Mars out to the outer planets again. 99% uh, Jupiter, uh, the, the, just a couple throwaway remarks on Saturn uh, on that because uh, we don't see X-ray aurora on Saturn. Um, okay, uh, quickly, uh, keep to minimum, we've heard about MI coupling on, on Jupiter-Saturn, uh, Ray Walker's very nice talk, but, uh, and, and we've heard about the Jovian aurora, so I'm going to focus on this and on the implications. Uh, you've seen this before from Melissa. Um, this is the, uh, the, another iconic uh, image of the, uh, from John Clark, the ultraviolet uh, emissions and alignment of Werner bands from, um, in this case, uh, Hubble, um, the uh, CIS, showing the main aurora oval, where most of the power is. Uh, here's the IO footprint, the other couple other, the Gal uh, Galilean satellite. I'm going to focus on this polar cap emission. What you've seen is the ultraviolet emission. Uh, some of it is flare, not always flare-like, but some of it is very variable, very flare-like. This is very steady. This is really jumping around on, on the dust side. And the X-ray emission is in the, up there, up somewhere in the polar cap. Uh, we didn't originally think so. In our uh, early 90s from ROSAT, there was this big blob of X-ray emission. We put it back, like everything else, to the middle of the magnetosphere. We were wrong, okay? Uh, the implications have changed dramatically uh, in the last 10 years since we now know it is not associated with the main oval. Okay, here is an image by Elsner. There's some also very nice ones by Randy Gladstone and others uh, of the X-ray emission. Uh, there's this commission. That's basically scattered solar X-rays, solar about a gigawatt. Uh, not terribly interesting for our current purposes. And here is the auroral emission, uh, again, up in the polar cap. Here's the main oval down here. Uh, and it's very time variable, although not obvious from this. Might add that Gladstone saw a 40-minute periodicity in his observations, which Melissa showed. She showed the uh, sort of blinking light there of that, which is interesting. Again, about a gigawatt. We're going to uh, interpret it as being due to 10 MeV ions. Okay, so that's where we're going with this. Okay. Uh, you've seen this. I'm not going to say anything. You see the main oval from the upward field line occurrence. There. We're interested in what's happening up in the polar cap. Uh, uh, the ion aurora is associated with, uh, with downward currents, also upward electrons, um, and you usually don't see those. Well, x-rays, we think you're seeing them now. You're seeing the downward currents. So what's happening up here in the polar cap with the, either return currents from this or from some other current pattern that is causing the x-rays? Okay. So in general, aurora are, are, are diagnostics of field line currents. Future card, at least in discrete aurora, you require parallel electric fields to an, um, maybe not the night mechanism, but a night light mechanism where you feel the loss cone. Um, um, it's not saying anything about alphanic aurora to here, too, but that could contribute. So 10 kV electrons at Earth are typical, 100 kV at Jupiter, what you saw on the main oval. I, I guess it was about 20 kV ish um, at Saturn. I should, should ask Ray Walker. Um, but we're concerned, this is. What about the downward field line currents? They're really hard to see. They're, at least at Earth, they're associated with these sort of quiet, upwardly flowing electrons, which are not that visible, um, uh, or at least remotely. I mean, if sure, you fly a spacecraft back and forth across these things. Like you could do at Earth, then you see lots of things that you don't see at the outer planets where you're stuck with remote observations. For them. Or spacecraft in the equatorial plane. Juno's going to be different, and some of the Ulysses stuff was a little different. But in Jupiter, we think this is, uh, these downward are linked to the outer magnetosphere and our magnetopause region, and our meta, meta, uh, at least some of it is manifested as uh, X-ray emission. So explanations, um, well, you could get X-rays from the solar wind. They're high charge states, they'll charge exchange to produce X-rays, that's what does it at comets. At Jupiter, you would need to accelerate them to about 200 kilovolts to get the proper uh, flux, uh, and, but we don't think that's the case here. We think it's probably going to be sulfur and oxygen ions in the outer magnetosphere, S plus, O plus, O double plus, which you have to boost the high energies to get x-rays out of them. 
implications. You get very energetic ions going down, you're going to get MeV electrons going up if you have such a field line potential, and you also will get proton aurora. The field line electrons going up are associated with radio waves, the probably things like the QP40 uh, emissions. Um, okay, so the quick explanation in case, uh, you know, the trap door falls beneath me, I will have gotten the main point out at the beginning, and then I could fill in the gaps. Uh, why is heavy ion precipitation needed? Well, uh, well, first of all, uh, you have to have the current my MHD stresses and current patterns out there that necessitates a field line current for whatever reason. Uh, as it, maybe Ray Rock was talking about, Kelvin Helmholtz, sort of viscous type stresses or a co-rotation lag or something's got to man high current. Uh, and then the ions must be accelerated, same way going down, same way the electrons must be accelerated going up because your ambient plasma populations cannot sustain that current. Um, uh, and it just so happens in this case, these ions produce x-rays if they're energetic enough. So line x-rays are emitted from excited O7+, plus, O8+, plus, sulfur nitrogen plus. These high charge states, when they interact, will produce x-rays, line emission. Uh, they're produced during charge exchange collisions with H2, or anything, any other neutral, but H2 is what's in the atmosphere of Jupiter. Uh, photons from lower charge states will certainly emit radiation, but it won't be in the X-ray regime. It'll be in ultraviolet. So, but to get the high charge state ions from the magnetosphere, O+, plus, et cetera, you need to have high energy electron removal collisions with H2. That's the key. That's what you need. Uh, note that solar one he heavy ions are already in high charge states. That, that works at comets. Um, so if you did manage to get enough of these into the cusp, that would also do the job, but then you'd get a lot of protons too. Okay. Uh, evidence for the, uh, uh, if we go now to uh, a spectrum of the x-rays, uh, again from an Elsner observation, but to some good ones from uh, Graziella Brandorati Raymond from XMM Newton X-ray Observatory. Uh, and I don't have time to linger on this, but this is uh, counts per second per KEV uh, x-ray flux versus x-ray energy. These are less than KEV, so they are soft. Notice that you get two regions, regions where there are oxygen lines, uh, helium-like and hydrogen-like, and regions where you have sulfur lines. Uh, if it was a comet, here's a cometary spectrum, you also get things which are carbon lines, which we don't see at Jupiter. Th that might tell us it's not the solo and charge exchange mechanism. Oh, and there is evidence for brimstone emission, but it's only a few percent of the total luminosity. Uh, uh, Graziella Brandorati Raymond associated those photons with the main oval. Uh, electron bremsolung, but that the higher polar caps there are the soft x-rays. You did manage to distinguish those, and I have a figure which I will not have time to show which illustrates that. Okay, the model. So Natalie Ozak in her dissertation, she's now a postdoc doing solar type plasma stuff in Israel at the Weizmann Institute, but she did a lot of work on this, and so did uh, uh, um, uh, we at all, uh, who was at Oak Ridge at the time. Um, so uh, in the model, you have an H2 atmosphere. You throw ion beams in at the top. Uh, you have stopping powers for the S and O ions. Uh, we put in electron loss and charge exchange cross-sections, ionization cross-sections. And uh, our collaborator, Dave Schultz, who's an atomic type, did a lot of calculations to state-specific charge exchange, leading to specific quantum numbers and angular orbital, orbital angular momentum quantum numbers, which you need to get the uh, uh, and so here are the processes. An O plus or S, Q, where Q could be, we can include 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, sulfur or even higher, and you will could ionize. That's, that's the main energy loss. The, uh, we, we track the electrons now, too, in our latest models with a two-stream code. Um, and you could excite Lyman-Werner bands. The electrons could excite the Lyman-Werner band, a more important a source of that. Um, and here's the key one, electron removal. You got one of these things, you'll you'll strip it of an orbital electron. And we keep track of these electrons as well. And the X-ray producing one, charge exchange. The product ion is in a high principal quantum number, always, N of about four or five. Hence, when the D excites, at least one of those photons, if you're in high charge states, they're gonna emit X-rays. If you're not in high charge states, it's not gonna emit X-rays, it'll emit UV photons. Okay, some of our stripping cross-sections, we have them for sulfur and oxygen from our collaborator. Showing, and again, no time for details. Here's an MeV per nucleon. 
And at these high energies, the stripping cross sections exceed the charge exchange cross sections, which I'll show. Okay? Um, and some of the charge exchange cross sections. If so you throw all these in there, and just look at the bottom one, uh, we have things like this for oxygen. If you do an equilibrium fraction, or Monte Carlo model, you will only get the high charge states plowing through the atmosphere, uh, 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 sorry, the X ray emitting states at these of about an MeV per nucleon. Otherwise, it's not going to work. You'll get, you know, there'll be too low charge. And obviously, as they get more energetic, they penetrate deeper, et cetera. Get too energetic, you get below the uh, methane layer. You get opacity effects. So uh, that doesn't do you any good either. So there's an optimum energies in here. And we get a reasonable spectrum. Now let me get out, uh, which sort of agrees, okay? Uh, let me uh, get some of the MI coupling aspects. These are, from our model, the electron escape from the atmosphere, okay? Uh, this is for the, uh, uh, we, we, we tuned it to a specific X-ray observations. This is the North Aurora for a mixture of sulfur and oxygen. This is the South Aurora. These are the electrons coming back out out of the atmosphere, back into the magnetosphere. Uh, and if we, we did it for a 20 kV electron aurora beam. So we also tried that for comparison. And we did it for photoelectrons. Here's, a photo, here's the photoelectron peak. So we tried it all. These things will be coming out. Now, might note that if you are indeed under some field line potential region that accelerated your ions from 50 kV as they were in the magnetosphere, 100 kV, to 10 MeV, the electrons, when they get there, are going to be accelerated to 10 MeV going outward. So, um, and let me indicate what the problem might be. So you need 10 megavolt parallel electric potential. That's, that's you know, you're not dealing with, uh, it's, a, it's an issue. Let's just put it uh, uh, charitably, okay? Um, if you just look at the cross magnetosphere potential, about 100 jovian radii, 20%, you can maybe pull a couple megavolts out, but you're gonna have trouble getting more than that. So maybe it's not steady state, you know, or maybe it's not simply just the night mechanism. Maybe there's an alphanic aurora. And where does the link true? Dynamically. And uh, hopefully uh, our answers will help come from Juno. Juno will be in a polar orbit. They'll see, first of all, it, uh, I'll feel better if they actually see MEV ions coming down. Uh, they should see, if you're above that layer, which is thought to be at a few Jovian radii, you should see MEV el relativistic electrons. Uh, you know, That'll be good news, and it'll also tell you where some of these downward currents finally are. Then the dynamicist could worry about why, what are the stresses, et cetera. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Oh, the hands are going up. How about Bob Lysak? L uh, let me ask the first question, though. When does the bus leave? Seven. Seven. Okay, good, 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 good. Yeah, okay, I'm willing to answer a few questions then, because I'm not missing the bus. <laughs> Tom, I'd, I'd, I'd certainly like to believe, I'm over here, oh. I'd like to believe your argument about uh, Alphanic Aurora, of course, but one thing, at least at Earth, that we find is that the, the Alphanic Aurora is usually at and below the energy of the inverted Vs coming from the, yeah, from yeah. the, from right, the right. parallel. So if, so if you can only get two megavolts, yeah, well, uh, that way, I don't. It, it would be uh, a trick to get 10 megavolts off. Well, of the uh, obviously, I'm grasping at straws and BSing around. Okay. Um, well, alphane waves are wonderful, so maybe they can do it somehow. But, but, in some sense, we're approaching it empirically. We need this. We really haven't gotten to how we got it. Yeah. Tom, um, I'm always very worried when I hear about ions carrying field aligned current. Ions are slow. Electrons are fast. Actually, probably a little bit more of that current, <laughs> if we calculate currents, are coming from those upward electrons. Absolutely. So that reduce, but that, that, if you plug that into something like a night, well, it's not going to be a night relationship. It's going to be the other side of the night relationship, which is the electrons being accelerated out of the ionosphere. I think Steve Knight in his original work actually did include that part as well, uh -huh. if you look back at that paper. But, but the point is, it's a lot easier to take electrons out of an ionosphere than to dump ions out of a... Out of, uh, a magnetosphere and carry the current you need. Yeah. But if you saw those electrons on that plot, that's probably that's carrying a couple times more. You get a couple of those electrons for every one of those ions coming in if you're going to book it current. I'm going to take a chairman's prerogative just to point out to those who are young enough not to know the story 
that Knight of the Knight Relation was a master's student at Imperial College who was assigned an algebraic problem by Jim Dungey. And this is really the Dungey current relation, even though the paper was published without Dungey's name on it. What was that, so Knight, 1972, wasn't it? Yeah, right, right. Okay, uh, okay Shinja. Uh, Tom, uh, I think you mentioned that there is a 40 minutes period. Uh, uh, not in all the observations. Some of the observations, there's about a 40 minute quasi periodicity, 30, 40, 50 minutes. Do you have period. an uh, explanation for that <laughs> or speculation? <laughs> uh, no, but again, uh, it would be interesting to think that it might be some al al alphanic ionosphere type resonator, again, be, you know, but yeah, we heard so about I where you have. Yeah things bouncing around between where the alphane speed is particularly high, you know? Uh, I'm, but uh, would it be 40 minutes? I'm not sure, you know? Well, I know we've looked for 40-minute periods, and also there are two- and three-minute periods that are seen in the aurora, and yeah. we can't figure out where they come from. And also we've seen in the, in the Io and Ganymede's footprints, there's a 40-minute um, kind of a periods in those brightness yeah. Yeah. And footprints. It's very puzzling.